In the last two weeks, I've invited you to submit questions about health care reform. I appreciate your active involvement, asking the questions, and voting on others. I'm committed to health care reform that keeps the best of our current system and fixes what is broken. I want you to have the most up-to-date, accurate information on the proposals being considered. I want to share with you some of the questions that have come from constituents. The first one, insurance companies are able to pick and choose based on pre-existing conditions, often making coverage for an individual cost prohibitive. Shouldn't that criterion be eliminated from all insurance companies? The answer, absolutely. I hear this concern all of the time. The reform proposal being considered in the House would prohibit all insurance companies from denying coverage, limiting care, or charging you more because of a pre-existing condition. Then the question, will a nationalized health care program encourage competition, best practices, and the high level of quality the private programs have provided for years, or will it demise into a lowest bidder situation full of red tape and of long waiting periods? We're not at all proposing what some call nationalized health care. The starting point for the proposal is if you like the insurance you have today, you'll be able to keep it. This insurance is often with private insurance companies. The proposals build on the current employer-based system, establish insurance market reforms, contain costs, and expand coverage. The proposal that came out of our committee creates a health care exchange where the uninsured can evaluate plans and obtain coverage at a group rather than individual rate. This exchange will contain a variety of, public, uh, of private uh, insurance options and a public option that individuals can choose if it meets their needs. The exchange will be a marketplace for plans to compete against each other based on cost and on quality and will serve as a vehicle for starting cost containment and quality improvements badly needed. For example, it will establish minimum coverage standards for all plans and cap costs. Another question. Is all of Congress and federal and state personnel going to be using the same health care that they want the rest of the public to use? If it isn't good enough for them, then it isn't good enough for us. The answer, we want to maintain the employer-based system, and federal employees will continue to receive coverage through their employer just like they do today. And very importantly, members of Congress are treated exactly like all other federal employees I'm covered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield and pay the same premiums as any other federal employee. So then the next question, what will prevent a corporation or other company from stopping current employee health care coverage and thus push employees onto the public system? A really good question. There are already incentives built into our tax system for employers to offer insurance. The vast majority of employers offering coverage today it is estimated, carefully estimated, will continue to offer coverage just as they do now. For employees, employers who don't offer insurance, there will now be a requirement that they pay into a common f fund, and that's only fair because it puts all businesses on a level playing field to each other and, and makes sure that they contribute into the fund. Small businesses will be exempt from the requirement, but if they decide to offer insurance, small businesses or others, they will get a tax credit to pay up to half the cost. Nonpartisan analysis have projected that because all of these provisions combined under reform, more employers, not fewer, will offer insurance. Then the next one. Name me one well-managed, cost-effective government program which is considered to be responsive and then tell me why it is again that we should want another program that will use our tax dollars to compete with private industry. My answer is this. Ask any senior. I think they will say that Medicare works. Millions of seniors rank Medicare as an excellent health insurance program. The cost growth in Medicare has actually been slower, much slower, 
and the cost growth in the rest of the healthcare system, despite the fact that it covers many of the most ill people. We need to encourage competition because we have to get a handle on costs. We have to create incentives for insurance companies to focus on prevention, to streamline billing, and to coordinate care. And then this question. It looks like only new policies will have a cap on out-of-pocket expenses to prevent bankruptcies. How will this be implemented, and can this be rolled into existing policies to offer this benefit to the majority of the insured? Because the bill remains true to the principle that if you like the insurance you have, you can keep it, the bill does allow current plans in the individual market to maintain their current level of benefits as strong or not as strong as they may be. However, if you would rather have a plan with limited out-of-pocket expenses, as all new plans will be required to have, you will be able to sign up for one of these new plans through the health insurance exchange that I mentioned. As I described, that exchange is a one-stop shopping location where you can compare and purchase a range of private health insurance plans or the new public health option. The legislation also requires employer-provided insurance to meet the new standards after a period of five years. Then, what method will be employed to prevent illegal aliens from using the system? The answer is clear-cut. The legislation, no matter what committee it has come out of, clearly states that undocumented immigrants will not be able to receive government assistance to purchase health insurance. Next, why are there going to be government officials coming into senior citizen homes to discuss end-of-life choices with them? Should it not be up to family and doctors to decide these things? Why is the government getting involved? I'm glad that question was asked because I become frustrated when people are provided information that's simply wrong and often is intended to scare them. That's what's been happening with this issue. The important provision included in the House, in the House reform legislation simply allows Medicare to pay for a conversation between a patient and their doctor if the patient wishes to speak with their doctor about an advanced directive or a living will that's allowed under state law. The purpose is to make sure that decisions about health care are made by patients and their families, not the government. It's the opposite of government intervention. This, will, this benefit will be purely voluntary, and patients do not need to have this cons consultation with their doctor if they don't wish to do so. The AARP strongly supports the provision, and this is what it has said. This measure would not only help people make the best decisions for themselves, but also better ensure that their wishes are followed. To suggest otherwise is a gross and even cruel distortion, especially for any family that has been forced to make the difficult decisions on care for loved ones approaching the end of their lives. Last question. I manage a pediatrician's office. Unless you work close to health care billing, you probably can't begin to imagine how much effort and money we must invest in just trying to improve the, chan the chance that we will get paid. How will that waste be addressed? I wanted this to be the last question because this is an area where I still believe we have more work to do and I can say this from personal experience. One of the problems is, as I think so many of you know and I have learned, that each separate insurance company has different policies, forms, and procedures that doctors have to use. The health care reform bill takes important steps to reduce wasted money and time by requiring all insurance companies to use common forms and standards for billing and administrative transactions. But we need to find additional ways to change the payment structure, and I feel deeply about this, to encourage coordination of care. We all know what it's like to receive several bills from different specialists after a hospital stay. Many of us know how difficult it is to make care decisions 
when there is really no primary care physician at the center of all the consultations and the medical advice that we're receiving, the present system is much too helter-skelter, and we need to find a way to knit it together, to knit it together, not only so that it is more cost-efficient, but we continue to have the highest quality of care. Over the years, I have had hundreds of live town hall meetings. I enjoy the back and forth, and I will admit it took me some time to get used to high-tech town halls. But what I have come to appreciate is whether it's online, on a telephone town hall, on Facebook, or in person, we can have back and forth that informs the debate. So I say thanks so much for participating and please continue to be in touch.